There is no doubt when you hear this chord that you think of Hendrix. But why do you think of Hendrix? What is that chord? How can you play that chord in other keys? Why did it become the Hendrix chord? So many questions around this chord, we should probably get them answered. Hey, thanks so much for joining me. It's really easy just to show you how to play that Hendrix chord on guitar and move on, but I thought it'd be more valuable to you if I actually went to the whiteboard and showed you, kind of broke down the chord for you, helped you understand how you could move it around the neck so you can get more out of it, and then talk a little bit about the history of that chord. So with that, let's jump to the whiteboard. All right, so when you hear the Hendrix chord, what are you hearing? The answer to that has actually multiple answers, but the first answer is you're hearing an E7, sharp nine. That's actually the technical name for the chord. It could actually technically be called an E7 flat 10. We're not gonna get that deep into this, so we're gonna go ahead and erase that because you'll see E7 sharp nine all over the place. Actually, if you Google E7 sharp nine and the word Hendrix, you're gonna see all sorts of stuff about the Hendrix chord. So this is also known as the Hendrix chord for those of us uh, kind of in the rock and roll scene. So what is an E7 sharp nine? How do you play it? Well, let's, let me draw out a fretboard here for us. And you're gonna have to just work with me here a little bit. We're gonna have to pretend like this is the seventh fret, okay? Right there. Uh, so that you can, you know, pretend like you're a little bit further down the neck. So how is this being played? Well, first off he's playing, and I'm just gonna put, uh, an O over here for open. So he's playing that, that low E string open. And then he has his finger down right there on that A string on the seventh fret, which is an E note also. And we're, we'll just go through the, the, the chord shape here. That is an E7 sharp nine chord shape. So what does all of this mean? Well, let's do this. Let's break down each one of these notes and how it relates to the chord. So that open string on that low E is the root, right? Because it's an E chord. So that's the root. We're gonna put that right there. The second, on the A string, that second note he's playing, that's another E. Because A, if when you're on the, on the seventh fret on the A string, that's an E. So you're actually playing a root. Uh, it's technically an octave, so I'll put RO right there. So that is an octave root. So that's also the root of the chord. The th on, the, on the D string, that's actually a G sharp, and that is the third of an E, okay? On the next string, on the G, he's actually playing a D, which is the dominant seven of the chord. The next note is a G, which is this is where it gets interesting. That's the minor third, or also known as the sharp nine. And then that next open E string is the root again, okay? So we have root, root, the third, the dominant seven, and the sharp nine, and then a root again. So all that put together in a pot, swirled together, that makes that E7 sharp nine. Okay, deep breath. The cool thing about this chord is the history behind it is that a lot of us in rock and roll know it as the Hendrix chord. And really that became a thing probably around 1967. Hendrix releases, you know, Purple Haze and that dun 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 dun. And it's just like, what is that chord? But you know, before that, uh, 1966, um, the Beatles had that chord in a D7 sharp nine on Taxman. And in 1966, also Cream played that chord in, um, in I Feel Free, in the, the actual E7 sharp nine. So this chord has been around, and actually the reason why you don't see chords like this a lot in rock is because they have traditionally been more jazz chords. When you get into these sharp nines, seven sharp nines, things like that, those have traditionally been in the jazz realm. And so you have like Dizzy Gillespie and, and Charlie Parker doing you know, playing that kind, you know, they did a, a duo together, um, All the Things You Are, and that chord showed up in there. And then John Coltrane, Blue Train, that was 1954, I think, 57, 
1957. Um, so in the 50s, you know, in the jazz movement, you know, the, the 40s, the 50s, in that jazz movement, you are hearing that chord a lot. Now, Hendrix comes out and just just makes it so predominant in a song that all of a sudden people are like, what in the world is that? And that's really the, the, how that chord became known as the Hendrix chord, not because he was the first one to play it or even the first rock and roll band to play it, but he was the first one to kind of make it super predominant where it put people back and went, oh my gosh, what is that chord? And that sharp nine, because it's a minor third, you have a third in the chord and a minor third or a sharp nine, there's like this rub with it, right? Like it's almost like a little bit of sandpaper there. So it really does something to the ear when you're hearing it. That's why it became so popular. So that being said, now that you know how to play the E7 sharp nine, what if you wanted to play D7 sharp nine? Well, the nice thing about this chord is this core structure right here is a movable chord, okay? So anywhere you move that, wherever the root is, and we're gonna color the root in green here just so you can see it, that's what the chord becomes. Now, if you move it outside of this E area, you're not going to wanna play the open strings necessarily. Um, so. You know, if you're gonna move this around, those open E's don't work in every form of that chord. Uh, they work in a handful of those, of the different forms, but not all of them. So as a movable chord, if we took this whole thing and we put that, um, you know, on the, if this became the fifth fret, right, instead of the seventh fret. So if we crossed out that this was the seventh fret and made it the fifth fret, that would make this note right here a D. And because that note is the root, this now becomes a D7 sharp nine. And the reason for that is even though we're not playing the two open E strings, so you're getting rid of this root and this root, with those four notes you're still playing, you still have a root, the third, the dominant seven, and the sharp nine. So you can bring that anywhere across the fretboard. Now, say we moved this and that was the, tw we played that on the 12th fret where that note then becomes an A, okay? So if this, if this becomes the 12th fret and we have an A, now we have an A7 sharp nine, okay? So that chord, even though it sounds super huge when Hendrix plays it because he has that open E string that he hits twice, dun dun, right? And it's just huge. The chord can be used all over the fretboard. You need to add the seven sharp nine to your movable chord arsenal, right? It's, you can play it anywhere now. If you need to play a B flat seven sharp nine, you can do that now because you, all you have to do is take that root note right there, whatever note that root note is playing, that's the root of the chord and then it becomes that seven sharp nine. It's that simple. That is the Hendrix chord, what it is, demystifying it, where it came from. I love this chord, it's awesome. I love learning stuff like this because having movable chords like a seven sharp nine in your guitar arsenal, your guitar tool belt, I mean, you'll throw that in at band practice, people are like, oh, that was cool, I should, we should do that more. And that is how you can sound like Hendrix with just one chord. Hey, in the description below, I have a couple links to some lesson sites that I really like. So if you want to sound even more like Hendrix, you can check those out with some on B-side. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you had a chance to subscribe. We'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for checking out one of my videos. Really hoped you learned something today. Here's a couple other videos you'd probably like, and I hope you had a chance to subscribe.